Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Matt Berbitzer Stull, Director of the University Honors Program and Professor of Music Theory. And it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's discussion, which is the fourth in the Spotlight series on environmental justice. Today, our topic is philanthropy. Before we get to that, however, I want to give a plug to next week's IAS Thursday talk. It'll be same time, same place on Thursday. And the topic for our two speakers is the relentless business of treaties, how indigenous land became US property. Um, which is actually a lovely segue into our land use statement, which I'm going to read. The University of Minnesota is located on traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The campus resides on Dakota land ceded in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. The IAS acknowledges this place has a complex and layered history. This land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relationships with it and each other. The IAS is committed to engaging to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. So today's speakers are Amy Wittemann and Paul Odegaard. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them and then I will turn the program over to the two of them. Amy Wittemann leads, leads the McKnight Foundation's Midwest Climate and Energy Program, which focuses on clean energy promotion and development in the Midwest. In this role, she works with a diverse group of business, consumer, social justice, environmental, and labor organizations. She also chairs the Midwest Clean Energy Founder, Funders Group and serves on the governing committees of the Climate Advocacy Lab and National Climate and Energy Funders Group. The Midwest Climate and Energy Program was launched in 2013 under Amy's direction after she led the board and senior staff in a redesign of its predecessor. Amy has leveraged grants, impact investments, and engagement of public and private <coughs> leaders to advance deep decarbonization of the region's energy systems. Outside of philanthropy, she has held leadership positions in several nonprofit organizations, guiding public policy advocacy, strategic communications, and coalition campaign efforts. When she isn't in meetings, Amy enjoys tromping through northern forests and bogs with her two young daughters. I'll have to ask you if you've ever been up to Saks Zim. That's one of my favorite bogs in the whole state. Isn't it great? All right. And then Paul Odegaard joined the Minneapolis Foundation as a philanthropic advisor in 2018. Paul has more than 15 years of communications and nonprofit fundraising experience. At the foundation, Paul works closely with donor advisors, business leaders, and professional advisors to educate, connect, and inspire thoughtful, effective philanthropy that supports our communities. He also leads the Minneapolis Climate Action and Racial Equity Fund and some unique collaborative efforts on social innovation research. Paul previously spent seven years with Minnesota Public Radio and American Public Media as a major and planned giving officer, partnering with donors to launch new content initiatives. Paul also worked for his alma mater, McAllister College, as an associate director of the annual fund, overseeing volunteer management, young alumni and student engagement, and strategic communications. When he's not strategizing with donors, you can find him chasing his children, playing trumpet professionally, cooking, or walking Greta, the family boxer. Since I connected with you about the sex in Bog, I'll tell you I'm a French horn player, so we can talk brass instruments over dinner, too. Okay, uh, honor students as usual will be retiring to Nolte right after the Q&A to have our discussion. And then those who are going to dinner will be doing that afterwards at uh, the Graduate Hotel. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming our two speakers. Um, hi, y'all. Um, my name's Amy Wittemann, Matt said, and I am, I'm just gonna scoot this like this. Um, I direct the Midwest Climate and Energy Program at the McKnight Foundation. And um, the McKnight Foundation is a family foundation based here in Minneapolis. And in addition to a program on climate change, it also does grant making across other areas, including arts, regional economic development, international food security and neuroscience. Um, I'm gonna show a video in a minute just to give you a little background on the, the history of the foundation and who we are. Um, and then uh, for the topic, uh, do a little definition around what environmental justice is. Um, and then 
kind of nest that into a broader uh, presentation and discussion just around how McKnight looks at embedding racial equity across all of its work, including environmental philanthropy and the climate program that I lead. <clears throat> so we'll start with this video so you have a sense of who McKnight is and what we fund. Okay. I was saying I'm not a, I wish I was a Mac person. Every generation faces times that require an abundance of imagination and fortitude. We live in such a time. It's a time to protect our natural resources and work toward racial equity. A time to be brutally realistic and fiercely optimistic. Optimistic because history has shown us the power of people who share a resolve to make positive change happen. The McKnight Foundation envisions a world that recognizes the dignity of every human being, where we celebrate the creativity of the arts and sciences and come together to protect our one and only Earth. Established by William and Maud McKnight in 1953 and carried on by their only daughter, Virginia McKnight Binger, and her children and grandchildren, we are a family foundation based in Minnesota. Today, we work across many disciplines, sectors, and geographic boundaries. Our mission, advance a more just, creative, and abundant future where people and planet thrive. Our values, stewardship, equity, respect, and curiosity. We take an adaptive and innovative approach, and we use all our roles and resources to realize our mission in our home state of Minnesota and around the globe. Our diverse programs are united in a quest to improve our shared fate. Great. Okay, so that's a little bit of background. And I don't know, how many of you are familiar with McKnight or have heard of McKnight Foundation? Okay, so William McKnight was the founder um, and he was one of the first leaders at the 3M Corporation. There's not a, an official relationship with 3M anymore, but that's where the original resources for the endowment came from. Um, so I've been at the foundation about 10 years, and I joined in 2010 as the program officer in what was then the environment program, and that encompassed both work on the Mississippi River and water quality as well as climate and energy, and then in 2012, 2013, started working with the board on what they wanted to do for the next phase of their commitment to climate change. So they've been funding in the climate arena for about 20 years and um, just wanted to do a refresh on the strategy. And, and the, the outcome is that we created the Midwest Climate and Energy Program, sort of bringing the climate commitment of the trustees in a little more closer alignment with other work that we do as a place-based foundation based here in Minnesota, but the Midwest Climate and Energy Program, we, we do we resource activities really on systems change across the upper Midwest, eight states, and I'll talk a little bit more about the, the program in a few minutes, but <clears throat> wanted to first start out just grounding the conversation and a definition of environmental justice. So the title of the program is Philanthropic Perspectives on Environmental Justice, and um, I just wanna point out that we have to um, white people here from philanthropy to talk about environmental justice, and we wanted to like note that, that we don't have um, a person of color on the panel or somebody who comes from the lived experience around environmental justice, and as you'll see in my presentation in a few minutes, this is definitely something we're very um, cognizant of and are trying to work on in a really intentional way, both at McKnight and at the Minneapolis Foundation, and I think that's true across most philanthropy right now. Um, so we're really lucky here in Minneapolis and Minnesota that one of the sort of preeminent grassroots organizations that works on environmental justice is based here, the Center for Earth, Energy, and Democracy. And I just cut and pasted this off of their website. They have a definition of environmental justice. And the founder of SEED is Dr. Cecilia Martinez, and she's written a lot, and maybe some of you have heard her lecture before on this topic on environmental justice. Um, and she is a national leader and right now is really working to connect the work of environment, the environmental justice movement with the broader climate movement and really trying to 
affect federal policy so that it is more representative and equitable than it really has been in the past on, on climate issues. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, their definition is that environmental justice and the environmental justice or EJ movement arose to address the unequal siting of polluting industries and the marginalization of communities of color in the national environmental agenda. So environmental justice or EJ encompasses both who's impacted most by environmental pollution, but just in, as importantly, who's at the table to develop solutions and participate in the decisions that will affect people's environmental, um, their environment and their health. Um, we also, the and hopefully you can see this, the um, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has done work and definition on environmental justice. And for those of you that haven't seen this, you can find this at their website. And SEED has also done this kind of overlay, looking at environmental justice areas of concern across the state. And this is the definition that the MPCA has used for environmental justice areas of concern. Um, you can see um, there are areas where the number of people of color is greater than 50% or more than 40% of the households have a health, household income less than 185% of the federal poverty level. So there's obviously a correlation between low-income communities of color and these environmental pollution areas and areas of concern. And it's worth noting that they're throughout the state. There's certainly major environmental pollutants and particulates in the metro region, as we're all here familiar with. Um, but there, it extends all around the state. And many rural communities, farming communities, really suffer from the impacts of nitrate pollution in their groundwater. Um, and that's becoming more and more of a concern across the state. So it's an urban issue. It's a rural issue. It's certainly an issue on tribal lands. Those of you who visited Leech Lake, I was up there last summer and seeing the Superfund site that's up there that's you know more or less just sitting there. Um, and it's like fenced off from the rest of the community. Um, so. Certainly a legacy of, um, I mean, I think the, these environmental justice areas of, of concern are a legacy of racism, of, um, you know, um, oppression of low-income people, that industries are cited, highways are cited in places where people don't have as much power, right? Um, so that's, I just wanted to sort of ground and like environmental justice is an actual thing as, as most of you know and just wanted to be sure to define that at the beginning. Um, so it's a, it, environmental justice is a particular focus and area of work but if we broaden out from EJ specifically, one of the key questions we've been asking ourselves at McKnight over the last several years is what does it look like to embed a commitment to racial equity across all of our work externally and also in our internal culture and practices. And we've made a really concerted and deliberate decision to, to use a race and lens for this work, like putting racial equity at the front end with this idea of targeted universalism that generally if you focus on racial equity and structural racism, other issues of concern or oppression are also met, whether it's um, income, different demographics, gender issues, um, and so, Racial equity is, an, is, is something that we are committed to embedding across all of our work at the foundation, and it's a journey. So I was gonna share a little bit about the path that McKnight has been on as a private family foundation on this work. Um, so we started maybe five years ago um, to talk more explicitly about equity and racial equity in all of our work, including in environmental philanthropy. Um, we participated, we've done several internal um, trainings as staff. I participated in something that's called the In Deep Initiative, and so this is to kind of give you a sense in national environmental philanthropy. There's been this relatively new initiative called Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity in Environmental Philanthropy, and then Dr. Keisha Harris, who's based in Birmingham, Alabama, who started the In Deep Initiative, also started something called the President's Forum on Racial Equity and Philanthropy. And so at the time, our CEO, Kate Wolford, participated in that President's Forum. And it's really bringing together um, program officers and presidents of private foundations to talk about our work, to talk about how we have a legacy of, of not doing right um, with communities of color, by communities of color, having people of color and indigenous people at the tables making decisions about how grant making dollars are used. Um, so these, this is something that 
we've been participating in. And just as a statistic to give you a, an actually grounded sense of this, that people of color make up 38% of the US population, projected to reach 53% by 2050, and yet people of color currently hold less than 16% of jobs in the environmental sector and less than 12% of leadership among green groups. So these are sort of the large mainstream organizations like the Nature Conservancy, Sierra Club. And the same is true for philanthropy. Um, <clears throat> so in addition to having conversations and do tr doing trainings within environmental philanthropy as an environmental program officer staff, we've been doing, as I mentioned, our own internal work around structural racism over the last few years. Um, that culminated in us releasing this commitment in January 2018 around diversity, equity, inclusion, and you can find that statement and all of these things on our website, mcknight.org. Um, we also, the video I showed with the new mission statement around a just, creative, and abundant future was created last year. So we, we've been doing this work on racial equity internally. We released the DEI statement, and then we updated our mission and values and approach to reflect what we're learning about how we have to do our work differently. So just to kind of like give you the sense of that chronology, our internal work really started in 2016, 2017. We did the DEI statement in 2018, released a new mission statement in 2019. And then last fall, we released uh, this um, new announcement, this transform transformative changes ahead to move our mission forward. Um, after we had our mission statement, we looked at all of our grant making work and really said, we wanna, we wanna go deep on a couple issues. And the two that the board decided to go deep on are climate change and then racial equity, racial equity within Minnesota. So that announcement was released last fall. And over the course of this year, the new racial equity program that's focused on Minnesota is gonna be staffing up. So that's gonna have a new program director, new program officers. And hopefully we'll reflect the communities that we work in a little bit better than our staff currently does. I think that's one of the goals. So um, now I'm gonna talk just a little bit and then I'll turn it over to Paul about how as the director of the climate program, I'm starting to embed racial equity and environmental justice and climate justice into, into the new, this new expanded uh, program on climate. So our goal for the climate program, the updated goal, is to take bold action on the climate crisis by dramatically cutting carbon pollution in the Midwest by 2030. And for those of you that follow the climate discussions. How many of you are familiar with like the IPCC report or sort of this concept of decarbonization? Okay, so most of you. So, you know, this is really, this goal is, is, is emanating from like our, the science, which is telling us that by 2050, we have to largely decarbonize the entire global economy. <laughs> and we have a 10 year window to get a huge head start on that between now and 2030. And so this is what we're really focused on. Now, um, we also have a commitment to racial equity. So it's interesting to see, like, what does this mean? What does this mean for our work? So I'm going to give you a little glimpse, and then I'm really excited for the discussion and questions on this. So one of the ways you'll see our work shifting from what we've done in the past is that when we think of, like, the metrics or indicators we're using for how we're testing directionality and progress, we're really looking at ensuring that the transition that we're gonna make in the economy is informed and grounded in the solutions and insights of, of people on the ground and communities in both rural places and urban places. So this idea of an equitable and just transition. That in the course of making change, we are going to be intentionally building the next generation of leaders. And if any of you attended the climate strike in September, you would have seen that increasingly this movement globally is being led by young people of color, especially young women and transgender people of color, which is just exciting and it's happening very, very quickly. And this is like on a global scale and was happening right here in Minnesota, everyone on the podium. And so we wanna really be supporting that next generation of leadership on this issue. We also want to see that the climate crisis is a top tier issue for voters, and we're seeing that, right? I mean, did anyone see the polls, the exit polls coming out of Iowa? Was that last week, that huge debacle? Oh my God, like, it seemed like it was so long ago, it was last week. Um, 
climate was the number two issue behind health care. And I think that's surprising people that this issue has just grown in salience from being like number 30 to now being like number two in Iowa. Um, so we want to definitely see that and that this has bipartisan support. You know, it's been actively politicized purposely by fossil fuel interests, and we need to break that down and depoliticize this. Um, other qualitative goals, we're getting off of coal, we're getting on renewable energy, we're normal, normalizing and making accessible clean energy technologies. Um, so what are our strategies for doing this? So we need to clean the power sector, we need to electrify buildings and transportation with clean electricity, and we have to capture carbon out of the atmosphere and sequester it in things like healthy soils. Historically, our climate grant making has been really focused on these like technological solutions, and these have to be part of what happens, right? Like, again, we have the science that tells us where emissions come from, and we know what has to happen. I think what you'll see, what we're committed to shifting is how we do this. So it's not just the what, it's also the how, and that's what we're putting more time and resources into at McKnight. So in addition to decarbonizing the economy and especially focusing on those four sectors, we're gonna be investing in more climate movement building and also strengthening democracy. So here's like some new observations that reflect the exogenous context that we work in. And I think our, our team's hypothesis is that for a long time we've been funding what I call the grass tops, sort of technocratic policy, regulatory work, mainstream white-led environmental organizations, NRDC, Sierra Club, there is a role for that, but the dosage of philanthropic dollars that have gone into the environmental movement have been mostly focused on that. We are gonna be putting, funding that, maintaining some of that, but then putting more of the lion's share of expanded dollars into this multi-issue, multi-racial, grassroots movement building work and our idea is if we bring both that grass tops and grassroots together, we're gonna win more of the short and the long term. And then our other hypothesis is that if we don't have a functioning democracy, we're not gonna advance any climate policy at the state or federal level. And I don't know, I'm laughing, like this is really real, right? Like gerrymandering, it's this is, so this is expanding. I guess what I wanna say is that the, there, we fund environmental justice efforts, and that's like frontline work, shutting down coal plants, supporting the communities who are most affected by that. But our work on racial equity and funding more organizations that are led by people of color is really changing how we think change happens. That it is at the Public Utilities Commission, it is at the state capitol, but it's also in the streets. And to transform our economy, we have to bring everybody along with us, and, we, and that means like meeting people where they're at and how they define and come into this issue. We need everyone. So more resources into this organized, diverse grassroots base, supporting strategic capacity, communicated vision. Those are more of where you're gonna see our dollars going, and again, this comes from this, like, tr this path that we've been on of, of changing how we think change happens. So one of the key questions, we, we, we create a learning agenda every year on our team to sort of give us sort of guideposts of where we're heading with our portfolio. And one of our questions is how do we build this social movement? And I would say this multiracial, multi-issue social movement and build durable power through our climate grant making. And so, and I'm about to stop. So some examples of that currently are, we fund something called the 100% Campaign, which if you're not familiar with, I'd encourage you to look it up. I think that, um, URL is 100%mn.org. Um, and this is, you know, again, for those of you who are sort of into um, policy change and advocacy work, this is really broadening what the definition is of this issue. It's bringing together organizations, grassroots um, organizations that work on immigration reform or SEIU, like labor unions, folks that are coming from really different points of view on this issue but see the climate crisis as something that the issue that's more core to their, to their members is like is intimately connected with. So this has been a really powerful campaign and a big piece of this is like this idea to change everything we need everyone and is telling the stories of people from throughout the state and how they connect to this issue. Um, this BIPOC table, so um, increasingly, you know, we're funding organizations led by people of color, indigenous groups, and they're creating their own coalition tables to do policy development. And this is a really important 
development in the field that we need to see more of is actually supporting these coalitions. And then Paul's gonna talk a little bit more about this, but one of, another key example we have from our work is this Climate Action and Racial Equity Fund that's a partnership with the Minneapolis Foundation. And I'll let him talk a little bit more about that. Um, and I think during the discussion we can talk a little bit about what we're learning from that fund um, and the work that it supports. But I'll stop there for now and turn it over to Paul. But I'm excited to talk with you all about what this means. It's, it's, um, it's messy, right? And it needs to be. <laughs> um, it looks clearer on a PowerPoint than it does in real life. And so, um, it's, but it's exciting and it's the right thing to do. And I think eventually it's the most strategic thing to do on climate as well. Turn it to Paul. Hi, everybody. How are you? Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Paul Odegaard. I'm a philanthropic advisor with the Minneapolis Foundation. And uh, I'm really grateful for your intention and your interest in this topic today. Um, before I go jumping off right into the Climate Action and Racial Equity Fund, I just want to give some grounding because uh, I work for Minneapolis Foundation, which is a community foundation. And I'm not sure how many of you, um, what you know about community foundations or how they work. So uh, I just wanted to walk through very quickly kind of what we are and how we exist in the world of nonprofits in the spectrum so you can have some context for how we try to work and uh, for some of the terms that uh, that I will work through today. So we are a nonprofit um, and we are similar to nonprofits in that you can give to us and get a tax deduction and we have a mission and we charitably fulfill it with the dollars that we receive. We're different in that um, we work as a way that donors can give to and through us, meaning we have um, our own pool of money that's a, a endowed funds and we draw off those endowed funds to make community grants to strengthen our community and I'll, I'll get into a little bit more specific nature of that. We also have donor advised funds and so and impact investing funds and some other community funds. So we exist as a place where donors can um, create a fund and work as a partner kind of giving to us and then through us and they use folks like me and our philanthropic advising team to sort of help um, get educated, define and refine um, the ways they're working and giving in community, the ways they're showing up and the ways they're trying to learn. And so that's part of the primary role of both my work and um, a lot of the ways that we work uh, collectively uh, with donors. Um, so we were founded in 1915, uh, a number of business leaders back in 1915 um, got together and we're seeing community needs that were not met by just having a growing robust economy and paying people. So um, they got together and uh, the Minneapolis Foundation is the second oldest community foundation in the world. Uh, annually we give out um, $70 million or more in grants and that's both from about um, six to $7 million annually from our own restricted funds and then uh, the rest from the body of donors uh, and donor advised funds that we've worked with or have set up an estate plan with us to go out and give specifically in the community. What that means overall is we have about $900 million um, under our own management and that is where we can actually achieve some collective action and gain some focus and sort of um, use our donor community to meet us where we are and to show us where we're going and hope that we can influence their own direction. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in our, um, in the ways that I, as we are observing. So one of the things that the community foundation is often tasked with is filling in gaps and living in these spaces in between or building certain coalitions to get alignment in the nonprofit community. The other thing that we'll do is um, we will use our own leverage to say, um, you know, you can come with us. So that gets, we are just refining, we're in the process of sort of finishing our strategic framework, but uh, the foundation exists to inspire and engage in personal and collective action to realize strong and vibrant communities. Um, though we are the Minneapolis Foundation, we care about the state and the region, um, we are not. Uh, relegated only to giving to Minneapolis. We're not relegated to only trying to cr create change um, in the cyber local community. And so we show up and do our work in a couple of different distinct ways. Um, actively in the ways that we give, we are very, very um, committed to civic engagement, uh, economic vitality and education. Uh, and so we, um, those are our core community grant making funds. Um, and so we try to promote civic leadership and participation, um, work on community belonging and inclusion, um, and 
really uh, to the point that Amy made around McKnight's commitment to um, creating a more just and equitable Minnesota, we have uh, been driving at equity in all of our community grant making. It, it really fuels everything that we do. And so we were deeply committed to trying to erase achievement gaps, educational gaps, and um, really increase upward mobility um, while dismantling the barriers that we see in the world. Um, and so we, we function in this place where we are both uh, supporting donors and nonprofit partners. Um, we're trying to help nonprofits refine, measure, and do their work. We're trying to help them level up. Um, outside of uh, the core monies we give, we also do things like we just launched like a $3 million um, sort of one-time capacity building grant round because we saw and we're hearing from a lot of nonprofits that did not fall in the scope of the things we usually give to um, that there are great needs. And me and my colleagues try to work with all of our donors to help point them towards those needs as we hear about them. We work actively to visit with nonprofits and community to learn about their campaigns and their initiatives and how they're doing their work. But we also are hearing like we can't always make a donor make a gift somewhere and we can't always um, broaden the pot of money we have. So we have to work in between there. And so we did some strategic planning to lay out some resources to help nonprofits broadly, the, the general nonprofit community in Minnesota, which is a extremely healthy, robust, and um, um, really uh, deeply accessed community by people and also by volunteers to, to sort of go on their next step with just sort of one-time cash infusion. Um, to the point about how we work with equity, um, there's a lot of, uh, I'm not sure how familiar you all are with the state of philanthropy broadly, the state of giving um, in the world. Um, but there's a, you're probably all familiar with the phrase like ivory tower. So there's like ivory tower philanthropy and dropping in and helping community without really getting to know them or getting to know why. Um, we believe that those closest to issues are best positioned to understand and address them. And over generations and across communities, we seek partnership to achieve strong and vibrant communities. Um, so we fundraise, we have community action, we also have uh, impact investing in other pools, and we have our donors funds. And um, we work in pretty unique ways to ask donors to sort of actually make grants to us um, that we will then go out and put into a community to create um, higher quality educational seats in communities, to create a pipeline for uh, accessible capital for minority or women-owned businesses. Um, and we actually provide a, like a 2% return on those funds and return them to the donors, but they jump into our own managed investment pool and we just expanded that to housing because of the issues that persist in this community. Um, and so uh, all that to say is we are both in the practice and in the study of philanthropy. And so there are a couple things going on in uh, philanthropy broadly that are very, very germane to the climate change and environmental justice um, and where those things meet. Um, and so one of the things that we're just seeing just as a state of philanthropy primer, um, currently right now there's extreme uh, extreme, extreme um, wealth inequality in a lot of places, right? And so I'm not sure, has anybody heard of the Resnicks? It's a big name in philanthropy uh, just recently. <laughs> Amy, I think, is the only one that's laughing, though. Um, the Resnicks were uh, a couple that owned Fiji water and a bunch of other things. They made a $750 million gift to Caltech um, to help basically just recently to fund their Institute of Sustainability. Um, so these are people that have been selling bottled water that have developed over time some sort of uh, conscious and then decided that they wanted to give back with their resources um, to help address this problem and to keep things available. Well, they're just, that, I mean, that's just a, a contextual snapshot or a microcosm of um, incredible wealth that is aligned with a corporation where a lot of this wealth is currently held that then um, develops a perspective and starts exercising it. So that, you will see that sort of thing, not with $750 million gifts, that's like the largest gift to sustainability that's been documented kind of to this point in philanthropy. But you will see more and more of that sort of thing where um, people and business leaders um, or former business leaders, retired business leaders will step out with the wealth they've accumulated. Um, and uh, the other part of that equation is that nonprofits broadly, though we are in a healthy and robust place in Minnesota, um, fewer and fewer people are giving. Like there used to be lots of measures around participation and broad coalitions of people giving. And with tax law changes and the ways that deductibility has been raised, that sort of giving um, 
still remains, but fewer people are showing up as counted sometimes for giving gifts, um, especially on the lower end. If they were making a participation gift, some of that incentive um, to just sort of stand up and do that has been removed in certain cases. Um, outside of the idea that you're giving money to achieve a positive benefit for somebody else, the real core of philanthropy. But surprisingly, when you survey people and what their behavior actually merits out after those surveys is a little bit different. And so you have to uh, just add that as a caveat for the way that things are changing and how people are showing up in philanthropy. Um, to the point of building, uh, Amy's point about building justice um, and power that's durable in movements and cultivating younger generations. Younger generations show up in a, in a much different way historically um, than generations before them. Uh, I am an old millennial, uh, just as a disclosure, I'm 37, but I technically hit the cutoff as an 82 birthday. Um, but I would say that uh, my, so I will use the term my generation and younger, um, I think that there's a much lower trust of institutions broadly because of what um, uh, this era has seen and endured with uh, both in terms of the financial clap as they were approaching college or in college or shortly thereafter where they couldn't find jobs or lost their jobs. Um, and also the ways that um, institutions have morphed over time, whether it's in um, dynamics of power and leadership, um, things that are being seen and mirrored from the political system that is not as coherent and functional as it used to be. Um, and so there's um, people want to get closer to the work, they want to touch it, they want to feel that they want to volunteer, and if you cannot create a space for them, you are going to have a gap in the way people are engaging with these movements. Um, and so one thing you will hear um, continually and repeatedly as we go on probably is the idea that we need to get more and more people of all backgrounds um, committed to engaging, doing this work, using their voices, using their political willpower um, to help this movement accelerate um, and achieve more equitable, just, and actionable outcomes because um, we've seen in action for 40 years, right? For more than 40 years, I think in the, uh, it was in the late 70s that one of the initial climate uh, uh, meetings with the White House and its staff appeared and they were saying, we know this is a problem, you have to do something, and for 40 years, almost no legislation on the national level has actually been advanced. So people of all generations, but I think especially younger generations, are looking at that going, at what point are we going to get some action that's meaningful. And so um, those movements are louder, um, but then you need to have a point of engagement and a point of um, collective action. And finally, I, I think one more thing about how philanthropy is changing just broadly is uh, previously, uh, does anybody, like, I actually don't know the answer to this question, but does anybody know how many nonprofits exist in Minnesota? Just in Minnesota proper. Uh, it's 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 almost twenty thousand nonprofits, uh, and th that number shifts because some open and some close and some consolidate. And, but um, so I bring that up with this last point: the connectedness of movements. And the reason I bring that up is because for a long time, somebody had a pet project. They wanted to bring kids to the Boundary Waters. I know of a specific person who's a great person that founded a nonprofit that's registered that exists that doesn't really get gifts. He mostly gives his own resources to execute this, right? Well, there are all sorts of Boundary Waters related nonprofits and outdoors related nonprofits and other things. So um, in an older, uh, with an older lens, you'd see these things just pop up and there'd be one. And then the ones that would be well-funded, that would be well thought of, that would be maybe um, more developed with their business and strategic planning, those organizations grew and grew and grew. Well, the other ones didn't necessarily just stop growing, they just stayed where they were. So um, you have a lot of these nonprofits that have some redundancy, but now as we do our work, as we look at metrics, as we look at the things historically that the Minneapolis Foundation has funded or the McKnight Foundation has funded or many other foundations, whether they're family foundations that are private or community foundations broadly, um, there was forever this, I, I wouldn't say forever, but there was a long lens of like thinking you could put a problem in this little frame, look at that problem, measure the frame, think you're making some measurable ac uh, action, and doing good work. And you, you, all the intentions and much of the work was very high quality. But when you step back in some perspective, you say, you know, Minneapolis Foundation has been giving to education for years. How have we given so much money to education and the disparity gap has gotten worse? That's an honest, actual conversation we're having um, right now in the foundation. All, all we've done is try to study 
promote study, give, uh, and enable the best of what we knew at the time with research to hopefully a attack that, uh, that issue with educational achievement gaps in Minnesota um, between uh, white folks and non-white folks. And it's only gotten worse. So you have to step back in those lenses, and I think one of the things that we're doing much better now um, among many giving fronts is we are stepping back and seeing that education doesn't happen in a box, climate change work doesn't happen in a box, uh, civic engagement work doesn't happen all alone, and that certain things motivate and engage people to uh, consider actually making their voice louder or gaining collective power. And so um, that is a shift over time. For a long time, organizations and people avoided the messiness of that overlap, and I think now um, many organizations are seeing that there is both beauty and power in going into that messiness and knowing that solutions do not come in very neat containers, that you have to work on things all at once and that some of these things are layered and overlap. Um, so getting a little bit more granular, and this has a lens about the environment, um, and this is even a, another case in point about the connectedness of movements, right? Um, Amy McKnight has a database, we have a database, we have things that we track, right? Well, there's no environmental justice tag that even exists in the Minneapolis Foundation Stadiums. There's environmental stuff, there's civic engagement stuff, there's economic vitality stuff. You could click a couple of boxes to get those organizations that do achieve that overlap, but previously systems even didn't good, do a good job of tackling that, right? And so um, if I wanted to give you environmental justice data, that would have taken tons of uh, extraction and nuance and reviewing manually, thousands and thousands, like I said, we give out 70 plus million dollars a year with our donors and with our own money. So you can't do it that way. So I just wanted to show you a little bit about the trend of what we're seeing in environmental giving broadly here from Minneapolis Foundation donors to set a level of how philanthropy is looking around the environment right this instant. Um, so going back about 10 years, you can see um, really great, so I'll just do a, a little snapshot from broad grant funds, or from Minneapolis Foundation funds to all environmental grants has grown basically from about $1.8 million um, nationally in 2010 to $4.9 million nationally. So it's, it's, it's not quite uh, tripled, but it's on its way there. Um, and the same thing goes for, for Minneapolis, uh, or for Minnesota environmental grant making, uh, where it continues to ramp up and grow. Um, so I, I mentioned the funds. We have about 1,400 donor advised funds. Those are households or families or collective units that practice giving together. Um, and so each of those entities is one fund. So the funds have gone from uh, about 100 making environmental grants 10 years ago to um, approaching 300 now. Um, and we, we had some commentary in the Star Tribune in December about this, basically this sort of study. So you're seeing more and more grant making going towards the environment, and some of those grants are also going towards um, environmental justice related causes, although how you might frame that and how you might categorize it um, could use some work. Um, that leads me to how we are working now with the Minneapolis Climate Action and Racial Equity Fund. So that's like kind of the state of philanthropy and how the Minneapolis Foundation works. Before I run on, I just want to ask if anybody has any questions or needs a breath. <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, I started, at, yes. Yeah, in fact, I had a meeting. Uh, so the foundation is led by uh, our CEO, Zarki Ryback, former mayor of Minneapolis. And I was actually in a meeting with him at 1.30 today to talk about how to, uh, we just added a brand new role that's a sort of data management database um, analysis guru to help our team um, track and do our work better, but also help the foundation broadly get a little bit more strategic about what they're seeing in the history of the database. So we actually just developed a like to-do for that person around basically combing that data that I just said needs to be combed to start labeling those tags on these intersections that we're working on. Um, and so that, that actually was the last thing I did before I started packing up and coming over here was having a meeting to work on exactly that, um, to start being able to count it better. And I think for our database broadly as it, um, as it continues to modernize and, and work, we will apply that across a lot of the different things that we give to person or you know as a foundation but there's a ton of opportunity to um, continue uh, to better uh, accurately describe and capture 
where we've been granting to, um, both as a foundation and through our donors. Thank you. Yes. Oh, gosh. I don't know the answer to that question off of the top of my head, but I know that uh, we are fortunate to work with some of, and I can't, uh, you, as you all probably well know, I can't go into the specifics of the types of donors or who we are working with, who are our partners or our collaborators, but uh, we are fortunate to work with some of the most um, historically uh, generous families that show up on many buildings on the U of M campus and, uh, and other arts, cultural, science, educational nonprofits across Minnesota. Um, so those folks, uh, to per, per the first point of the state of philanthropy, large gifts can sometimes skew what those ratios are. Um, but a lot of, actually all of our primary donors generally use their funds um, both for capital giving, but also to fulfill all of their annual gifts. So it, I don't have a good answer. Um, if you stop by, I will give you a card and I'll actually go look at to see what we can say. Um, we don't always, capture that exactly in the in the record either. It'll just say, uh, you know, a gift to the University of Minnesota Foundation. And, and it might say for this project, but it may, it may not say for the, you know, the Next Generation Campaign, et cetera. Um, so uh, about uh, a year and a half ago, um, because I'll be coming up on my two year anniversary with the foundation in May, uh, I was grabbed by, by R.T. Ryback and R.T. said, Paul, I have uh, this thing I've been working on with the McKnight Foundation in the city, um, and I want you to come sit down with me and them just to learn about it. Uh, and it was a conversation that was happening because uh, RT has a passionate interest in um, environmentalism and climate change and, and related work around there. Um, the McKnight has its focus area, and McKnight's uh, Amy's colleague, uh, Brendan, worked with RT at the city of Minneapolis and helped uh, draft the Minneapolis Climate Action Plan, the broad document that sort of set out to provide a baseline for where the city of Minneapolis wanted to go with their own work um, around climate change and climate action. Um, and uh, because Brennan had come over to McKnight, uh, there were folks from the mayor's office in the city of Minneapolis that were also involved in this conversation. So they said, hey, uh, come to this meeting and learn about it. And what it came out to be was that um, through the uh, generosity of the McKnight Foundation, uh, there was uh, an interest in getting a little bit more hyper-localized and getting money out in the community. McKnight, I mean, you didn't actually toot your own horn, but how much money does McKnight give out just in the realm of, of climate and energy? We give out right now $19 million. Yeah, $19 million annually to nonprofits all over, right? Uh, that's an amazing amount of generosity and it goes on a broad level to energy change and previously to water systems and all sorts of different things. Um, and that was all kind of going regionally and there was stuff that was happening right here but there was also stuff that was really dedicated at, the, at things happening all over the Midwest. Um, and so what was expressed to me in that meeting was that there was an interest in getting kind of hyper-local about climate change to start building more collective action and trying to see if we could generate some visibility for the movement and also doing some engagement around communities that both have been historically um, feeling more and more of the harms of, of climate injustice and folks that were also feeling um, harms from the city or from just the region's general uh, issues with racial equity related stuff. So it started out, uh, we wanna cre maybe create a fund seeded by the McKnight Foundation to help get money locally into climate change stuff. Well, as we started to partner with the city, um, the city also uh, had a lens around their uh, racial equity program, which was an emerging thing for McKnight, which is an emerging thing and a point of emphasis for the Minneapolis Foundation. So it went from being the Climate Action Fund to the Climate Action and Racial Equity Fund, which I think is incredibly important. It's amazing um, what just a one or two word change will do if you're not committed just to semantics, but actually to doing the work. Um, so the fund itself, uh, have, have any of you heard of this fund? I mean, you're here today, but have you ever heard of, have you heard about what it does, or what it is? Feel free to, read. yeah. Okay, so it's a fund that's for um, place-based community-driven initiatives that uh, result in demonstrable reduction in local greenhouse gas emissions. Now that part, just for context, is the part that is driven in the Minneapolis Climate Action Plan. It also is key, I think, to, to the work of McKnight, um, 
but it, it's really uh, a very specific tactical thing. Um, and the, so the funding from the grant, which was a criteria that we established sort of in committee with me representing the Minneapolis Foundation and uh, people from the mayor's office, the office of sustainability, um, a council member's office, the office of race and equity, and also the Minneapolis Green Zones have a representative on our committee. And then with the Knight Foundation, we established some criteria that we thought would help us govern how we give out these grants in community and how to best utilize these resources to sort of get um, get a foothold in and start making more active hyper-local grants towards climate change and, and racial equity. Um, and so yeah, as you can see, the, the goals of that plan, the climate action plan around greenhouse gases were energy efficiency, uh, use of renewable energy, reduction of vehicle miles traveled, and reduce the community's waste stream. Um, they also, the city of Minneapolis's strategic racial equity action plan has things to do with, with um, uh, vendor sourcing, racially desegregated uh, information, um, really engagement on, on levels to ensure that there are some criteria that's not just, well, we like this one, so we wanna, wanna give to it. Um, so that fund started uh, actually around this time a year ago. I got a note from Brendan that it was gonna go forward and we were going to, that we should start planning and uh, then it was announced at the, the Mayor Fry State of the City address um, last year. Um, and so we had two rounds of grant making. We had about um, between uh, the generosity of the McKnight Foundation and um, some other donors that heard of the initiative that we were able to approach through the foundation. We had about about $130,000, $140,000 to give out overall. Um, and so we broke it into two rounds to announce it and then to do a second round. And though, so you can see the grants below. Um, and I, I wanna just show these grants and you can read about them and I wanna talk a little bit about contextually who these organizations are. Minnesota Re Renewable Now is a, a, a very new organization um, that's headquartered uh, in North Minneapolis, founded by two different folks that really wanted to encourage the use of community solar by creating a solar garden in North Minneapolis and also um, between the city sustainability office and um, other efforts, there are a lot of like home energy related, like how can you improve your your dwellings, energy efficiency, and help that cut carbon footprint. Um, a lot of stuff that the city had been doing in North Minneapolis. And so as the city expanded its green zone stuff, are you all familiar with green zones? I also wanna just, okay. So green zones broadly and in, Minne in Minnesota are sort of strategic opportunity zones where maybe historical investment of capital and other in, uh, infrastructure um, had been largely ignored. Um, and I, I would say, uh, you know, most of these green zones are, are the areas in cities across the US where um, it's largely people of color who have been affected by redlining, who have been affected by environmental harms, um, lack of investment in businesses and other things. And so that was another criteria uh, for the city of Minneapolis and for this region that they wanted to create um, specific in incentive to invest in these green zones. And there are a lot of other uh, capital and bank related investing things that are also being developed um, to help uh, accelerate capital into these communities that have not had access to it historically. Um, and so we made, a, so uh, the criteria for our granting, and I wanna just, it really has, it has those energy efficiency things. Um, it has the, uh, the racial equity component of the city's racial equity plan and then the, the need for the project to happen, and then you get extra points if you're in a green zone. Um, and so all, a lot of our grant making has been directed towards areas that are in or adjacent to green zones um, in Minneapolis. And, and for your own contextual setting here, a lot of that is in historically North Minneapolis, um, up from, from 55 into basically all of North Minneapolis, and then really south of downtown from the Franklin Phillips neighborhood, south for away are like the two Minneapolis green zones um, first that have really largely been um, ignored or disenfranchised over time. So uh, we, we chose three uh, projects in the first round. Um, Minnesota Renewal now was pushing folks um, to sign up.